So just to fix the uh, next couple of uh, schedules to make sure everybody. Uh, so today, Pierre will discuss tightness issues. I think 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Is that correct? So, which means that I should not finish too late if you want to have a non-zero non lunch. And so, and the next lecture, sort of Monday, next lecture at 9.30, and then there will be some stuff probably on Monday afternoon. We should not leave you half a day uh, breathing, but um, we'll see by then. Okay, so um, what did we do yesterday? Um, so yesterday we completed the proof, basically, of the fact that when you have a domain D and two boundary points, we call X and A, that if you were looking at a discrete exploration process in a lab, so you take a D delta, an approximation of this picture on the lattice of size delta, with A delta, X delta, and we were taking the discrete approximate, I mean, the discrete exploration process from X to A when we decide to color these two boundaries into these prescribed colors. And note that the coloring of the boundary, you know, here in the case of percolation, it's important just, uh, I mean, it's not important. You know, you just, you could decide that, you know, these colors are just a fiction, you know, just uh, the colors are just there, you know, to make sure on the boundary to give, to tell, you know, to the exploration process what it should do when it hits the boundary. So it's convenient to say that here it's orange, here it's blue, because in that way, you know, the, the sort of uh, microscopic, you know, decision taking of this exploration process is the same in, inside the domain and on the boundary. Uh, so, and, and if you think a little bit about it, what this exploration process is doing is always leaving, if, if this boundary would not have been colored before, you know, it's just always leaving blue to the left and orange to the right, so that's, you know, what happens in the middle. And when you hit the boundary, right, then the rule is that you turn, okay, now you have, the, you have choice, right? Either you turn in this direction or you turn in that direction. And in that, and the rule then is just turn towards A. Okay. So this is just this saying that you explore, you know, in the inside of the domain in each time and you aim towards A is the same as saying that you explore in the inside of the domain and you assume that the boundaries are colored in that, that way. So we take a lattice approximation of this and we Suppose, remember that the, 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 in what sense does it mean that it is an approximation of DAX? In the sense that this is um, uh, sort of this Kara Theodori convergence uh, sense. So which means that it doesn't mean that the boundary of D delta converges to the boundary of D because, you know, we might even, I mean, we might have, you know, convergence of domains like this. Right, and you know when these guys close up in the limit, and in that sense, the limit of that you know type of domains would be that domain. And this type of convergence is, uh, I mean, uh, is allowed also in in this theorem. Just because you know Smirnov's theorem holds for this type of convergence, and then everything we said holds also if d delta converges to d in that sense. So that's one remark. So what we said was that, so we define gamma delta, and so the law of gamma delta converges to that of a random curve gamma that can also be constructed via Leuven's equation 
with driving function. A Brownian motion running at speed six, right? So, and as I explained to you yesterday, I mean, the, in this theorem, you know, there are, it also says some things about the fact that if you take this as a driving function for Leibniz equation, what you construct is an increasing family of compact sets that is itself generated by a simple curve, uh, by, a, by a continuous curve, which is not necessarily something which was obvious to start with. Okay, so as I told you yesterday, there were sort of a couple of results that pop out of, of this um, statement. Uh, for instance, the reversibility of SLE6, the fact that SLE6 from X to A and from A to X, you know, are generated by a random curve gamma that uh, have the same law in both directions. So, because if they are both the scaling limit of the interface from X to A or from A to X, it's the same in the discrete setting, so the scaling limits are the same, and therefore the Leibniz, I mean, the SLE curve from A to X or for, from X to A are the same modular time reversal. And there's another property of SLE6, of course, that comes out of this, which uh, comes out um, from the, this, no, this question of um, uh, coloring that I just mentioned. So if you take X here, Imagine that you take A here and A prime. So imagine that here you know everything is blue. Here you know everything is orange. But here you haven't decided yet. You don't know. So you start exploring here this interface in the discrete setting. Right? So what I want to do is compare the interface that goes from x to a and the interface that goes from a, a, x to a prime. So it's clear that so the interface that goes from x to a would be the one that basically decides that you draw if you color here everything in, in orange. And the one that goes to a prime would be the one that you get when you draw everything in blue here. And it's quite clear that in the discrete setting, you know when you start from x, and as long as you haven't touched a, th this portion here between A and A prime, this, these two explorations will be the same. You know, you start exploring between blue and orange, and the rule is exactly the same, and as long as you haven't decided hit here, you don't have to decide whether to go towards A or towards A prime. This will, I mean, the decision will only be taken, you know, at the moment where you hit here somewhere. And then, okay, the one that goes to A goes to the left, and the one that goes to A prime goes to the right. So what this tells you is just that in D, because this is true in the discrete setting and the discrete models converge to the continuous one with a uh, sufficiently strong uh, topology, so SLE6 from X to A is equal to SLE6 from X to A prime up to the first time at which it has to choose, it hits the segment AA prime on the boundary. Okay, so that's just the picture I erased. And here already you have a little, you, you, you see that we have a little um, uh, thing one has to be careful of with. When I said um, they are the same, uh, you might say, well, they're not exactly the same because SLE from X to A has a natural time parameterization, which is given by the half plane capacity when you map D onto the upper half plane, and in particular when you A onto infinity. Right? So the natural time parameterization of SLE, when you look at it from X to A, roughly speaking, is measured in terms of the size of this growing thing here, seen from A. That's the idea, right? So the half plane capacity is looking at the size seen from infinity in the upper half plane. And so therefore, the, this time parameterization of SLE going from X to A is, you know, in terms of the size of this KT seen from A. 
And if you look at the SLE from X to A prime, you measure the time parameterization, you know, that you use to define this increasing family of hurls and the brown emotions that are behind. You, s you view it, you know, as seen from A prime. You know, and, and this, you know, this size of this thing may look, you know, this guy may look bigger from A prime than from A or vice versa. Okay. So the, the half, I mean, the capacity seen from A or seen from A prime are not the same. So when I say that they are, the, they are the same here, that these two guys are the same up to the first hitting time, it's of course always modulo time reparameterization. You know, it's just the law of the curve up to time parameterizations, which is okay because we used actually this, uh, this notion when we said that the discrete guy converges to the continuous guy. We used, you know, we identified two continuous curves if they are, you know, obtained by continuous time reparameterization one from the other. But here, you know, we already see that there is something, you know, very special about SLE6, which is that, which is basically, if, if you look at this this way, that I start from here, the SLE6, right, in the upper half plane, right? So it, it is, has a time parameterization natural one, which is given by T, so which says that the half plane, you know, A of KT is equal to 2 times T. And therefore, I have my conformal map GT, and here I have WT and so on, which is a Brownian motion running at time six times. Now, imagine that you look at SLE that doesn't go to infinity, but that goes, say, to one here. In order to define this with a Brownian motion and a driving function and so on, the first thing you have to do is to map this onto the domain zero here, infinity, where Infinity here is the image, you know, under here, it goes g of 1. And 0 is to going to 0. Right. So maybe 1 was not a good example. So it's basically something involving uh, minus 1 over x, minus 1 over z, this map g, except that you have to shift by plus 1 and map back by minus 1. So basically that's just a, a mapping like a, minus 1 over z minus 1, uh, plus 1, or whatever. Okay. So it's just, this is just, you know, a, a, a fixed, simple uh, map. And now the definition of the SLE from 0 to 1 here in that domain is just g minus 1 of the SLE from 0 to infinity here. Okay. So this one, let me call a, another time just to emphasize that there's another time here. So here, I define an SLE in the upper half plane with a W tilde S. Right? And the W tilde is, again, just a Brownian motion running at speed 6 times t. And now, what, I claim, what you get is that this guy that you get here, when you map it by g minus 1, you get exactly an SLE itself. But the point is that when you map this by onto that, basically S is not the same as T, right? You have a time change S of T. However, you know, W tilde and W, they are both, you know, Brownian motion running at a speed six times T. So roughly speaking, what is going on here is a little bit the type of thing that we've seen yesterday already, which is that you know, when if I have a Brownian motion WT, you know that if I if you take say the integral of between zero and and uh, uh, and t of uh, you know you do a time change say S of t being something like U of uh, okay now I'm out of uh, S of t zero U of t dt right. U squared. And then you define something like uh, uh, V of S would be, you know, 1 with W, well, integral between 0 and T0. But something like, the, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit, maybe it's simpler if I, if I use this, uh, you know, this accordion uh, picture I used the other day, right? 
So you use just the scaling property of, of the Brownian motion uh, that you are going to use, and you just say, well, I mean, you know, in, in that very organized, you know, uh, say things, maybe here I blow up at certain times, you know, this, I, ch I choose different parts, and I use the scaling property of the Brownian motion there. You know, you know, I, I, inc I increase the picture there in, in both directions, so that still, and you see that, you know, you could stretch things here, but using the scaling property of Brownian motion and stretch things, you know, locally in a different way, depending on the different issues, you know, so that what you end up here with is still a Brownian motion, running at the same speed. So we just use, you know, the scaling property of Brownian motion, but uh, in a different way at different times. Right? And that's precisely what is going on here. Right, so the way you get W tilde out of W is exactly, you know, via that time of just scaling property. So basically, you know, W will, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at sort of, uh, if you think of the time parameterization, parameterization gamma T here, okay, what is going to happen is that if gamma gets close to 1, right, then uh, this S, which is the size seen from one, will you know increase very fast because it, you know if, if gamma you know starts doing coming close here, you know that one has the impression that this curve is getting very big. Okay. So the time now is going to run very fast, but on the other hand, the W tilde, which is basically what hap what this guy sees when you map this back onto, uh, will the W corresponding you know to how what you obtain for W tilde, if you map W back by, by these three maps, then uh, W tilde will start moving much more. So, you, and time runs faster and the guy moves more, and so that's basically just, you know, means to use the scaling property here. So it's, it's, that's, that's the idea. But I want to emphasize this, right, so that here already, in, in this little, so this is what we call the locality property of SLE 6. That here in that picture, you, are, you already have this, this, one has to be careful, because here this is something very, tr almost trivial in the discrete setting, that you know the exploration process going from A and the exploration process going to A prime are the same up to the first time at which you have to choose. But in the SLE setting, in the Leuven evolution setting, uh, this is not the most natural thing to look at, because you know, a priori, these two chains are defined using different time parameterizations, and uh, one has to be take care of that. And in fact, sort of, but still, you, you see that it's possible. So it is possible to prove this statement directly in the SLE setting, just using the picture I drawn here. Right? You just say, take an SLE gamma defined by this, map it here under this map G. Once you map here, you define, you know, something like G tilde uh, T. Use the correct time change and check that for the correct time change, sort of if you parameterize this guy now by the size of this guy instead of the size of this guy, this, the image of this point W here under this, under these three maps will move like a brown motion running at speed six times T. So it's possible, you know, to prove the locality property directly using, you know, standard stochastic calculus method because the way you will get W tilde out of W is roughly, you know, uh, via, again, some Ito formula type consideration. So you have two different proofs of the same thing, which is this one via SLE and one via the discrete model because you know the discrete model converges to the continuous one. So the reason I'm emphasizing this is that there's another very useful thing that uh, one can do, which is instead of, you know, targeting a point on the boundary here, is to target a point in the inside. So uh, let me just motivate this uh, as follows. Suppose that in the discrete setting, you want to see uh, let me take an analysis like this. You are asking, is there a green, an, an orange path that joins, you know, the inner part from the outer part of this annulus when the mesh size is small or fixed, you know, right? Okay. 
How do you check uh, that such an event holds or not? And as I told you, uh, we would like very much you know, to be able to check that such events using exploration processes. You know, not just as looking all the, you know, all the pictures. You, you might say, well, just look if it's true or not. But how do you see it? You know, how do you algorithmically check that, it's, that there is such an orange path or not? Well, it turns out the natural thing to do is the following. You start anywhere on the boundary. And remember, an exploration process is always, you know, ex needs to expose the two colors, the interfaces between the two colors. So, when do you have an orange path? What is, if there is no orange path joining these two things, the complement of this event is the, the event that there exists a blue circuit. So now I just changed my question. When can, I mean, can you check whether there's an orange path joining the inner to the outer side? And I just say, can you check that there's a blue circuit surrounding the inner part inside this? Now imagine that you start from here. And say we leave blue to the right and, and, and orange to the left. And we follow the following rule, which is that we always target when we when we bounce on the on the on the, the boundary, we always target the inside. So that means when I turn like this and I hit here, I turn left. Okay. Uh, and when I hit here, I turn right. Because I want always to go in the direction of the. Okay. So, anyway, if you do this, you know you will tend to get closer and closer to the because you always go to the inside. Uh, to towards the inside, you will always tend to go to. Tower, I mean, the, you get closer and closer in some way, a conformal way to the, the inside. Uh, disk. Now, what you're not, what this interface anyway has to do, is, will never be able to do, is cross, you know, a blue barrier. I mean, the only way it can cross, you know, uh, go uh, cross a blue sort of thing, which just, it's, it's at that moment here, when, when the blue hits the boundary here, and you go away, you turn to this direction, so maybe you have to go around basically the the blue arc that goes all the way to the direction and goes then to the left. Otherwise, you know, you will never be able to traverse uh, a blue, a blue thing from from the right. Okay. So that means that if you have a blue circuit, anyway, this exploration process will have to dis discover it at some point because it will, you know, if the blue circuit is here, it will have to go around and to close here at that moment. It will close a loop around. Uh, the process uh, around the inner disk. Okay. So of course you have two things that can happen because you could close, you know, make a loop around the inner disk in that way, or you could make a loop in, around the inner disk in another way, which is uh, the other way around, right? So say if I start like this, and if you turn like this, what happens? Then here you have discovered also. Uh, loop around the inner disk, but this time of the other color. Right? So depending on whether this gamma, you know, makes a loop, I mean, uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise, it means you discover uh, an orange uh, loop here, or you discover a blue loop here. But if you discover an orange loop, maybe you can continue, you know, you can continue turning to that direction because you still want to know if there's a blue loop here that surrounds this guy or not. Right? You know that there will be already an orange path from here to there connecting the outer boundary to this loop. And then you have the same question again, you know, whether there is an orange path connecting the loop that you have discovered to the inside. So when you are here, you can maybe, then you want to continue turning right here, so following the same rules, and then you ask whether you will finally you know, disconnect in one direction or the other. So here we already see 
that it is quite natural, you know, if you want to, to ask questions about probabilities of crossings of long annuli or things like that, to not only to look at, uh, you know, uh, interfaces that join, you know, one point on the outside to another point on the outside of the domain, like X and A there, but to have an exploration that starts somewhere on the outside and, you know, targets an inner point. Now, there's a little remark that you can make, or, I mean, so, which is the following, which is basically a radial, what we call radial Leibniz chains. And in fact, everybody in complex analysis, except now people who have done a little bit of SLE, or have exposed to SLE, when they say Leibniz chain, this is what they mean. They never mean a Leibniz chain in the upper half plane like the one we, 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 you know, I, we you have been exposed to at the moment. Right? For you now, you know, Leibniz chain is something parameterized by half plane capacity in the upper half plane and so on. The initial definition by Leibniz uh, was in the disk targeting an inner point because that's the thing that was useful for him in, in for the question he was looking at. So here's the picture, and, and maybe I, I will just... Uh, so maybe before doing that, you know, I should remind you that we have seen already, you know, different versions, different stories and different versions, and each time, you know, that... So we had, you know, the idea that you start from here, you have gamma, a grow, something that grows here, you use the conformal map V, and here you have WT that moves like this, and you have a given equation like this. And already we had another one, which was, you know, when you take three points like this, you had something that, that was growing here. You took the conformal map like this that maps the three boundary points onto the three boundary points, and then it's, you know, XT that was moving here. And in both these cases, we had the, the idea that actually when, once you know where the WT, how the WT moves, you know how this thing grows. How, once you know that our XT moves, you know how this thing grows because you are always doing sort of back onto the original thing. Well, here it was slightly different because the time parameterization was not so natural. So here, basically, what you do is just, well, let's, let's draw it here. You have a curve gamma that is growing from the boundary and that is growing, you know, like this. So, of course, there are plenty of ways to see this growing curve gamma from start, that starts from one. One way to see it is just to say, well, that's just a Leibniz chain, and let's parameterize it, you know, by its size seen from minus one, as we did before, and define, you know, so it's defined via the conformal map that goes from the disk onto the half plane. And uh, via a function wt, right? that's one way to look at it. But there's an other very natural way to do it, which is to say to use another normal conformal map, because of course the, the circle is a very nice uh, thing which has symmetries. So here we, instead of using the conformal map in the half plane, we use gt. So here, if we have gamma up to time t which maps the complement of the slit disk back onto the original domain, right? And now we're going to, instead of normalizing, you know, things at infinity, or which roughly speaking here in that domain would be at A, or in the disk there would be at minus one, we normalize things seen from zero. So we use the conformal map GT um, such that uh, GT of zero is zero and g prime t of zero is positive. So in other words, you know, this direction is preserved. So remember, in the upper half plane, what we had was that we had gamma t here and that we used the conformal map g t in the upper half plane. So maybe I should use f here in order for you not to be confused so that you see it. that it's a different story. 
that here GT was normalized at infinity and that everything was defined by local properties of GT at infinity. So the GT of infinity is infinity, that the first derivative is one, and uh, that the second order term in the ex Laurent expansion near infinity is zero. That was the way you defined GT. You know, and then you were looking at the image uh, of the tip here, and in the end, you ended up with the fact that WT had a B to be a Brownian motion, and the fact that that was the right uh, way to look at things in order to have a Brownian motion is related to the fact that seen from infinity, you know, all the points on the real line are the same. Right, so that in some way, seen from infinity, whether you are zero, W, or something, the way you're going to grow is the same, and therefore that you're always starting the same thing and adding up the same uh, uh, IID uh, increments. Now here, we do the same, except that we, instead of taking infinity, we take zero. So of course, saying that f of zero is zero is already you know, fixing you uh, more than saying that the image of a boundary point is a given boundary point, because here you, roughly speaking, fix two real numbers, because when you specify the image of a complex number, you have to say which complex number it is, so we specify the complex, I mean, an imaginary part of the image of zero. So you still have just one other parameter to tune in order to correct, to define uniquely what the conformal map Ft is, and so you just decide to take the direction at zero to be uh, positive. I mean, the derivative of zero to be real so that there's no rotation around zero locally. So of course, this is the usual you know, way you use a define a Riemann map, actually. So it's not via three boundary points, but it's rather via uh, points in the middle, of course, because it's also simpler and more general in some sense or requires less definitions. Because once you start at looking at derivatives of the boundary, it's useful to know if the boundary is actually differentiable or things like that. So Anyway, now, why is zero special? I mean, why is this also as good as the other definition? It's because seen from zero, all the points on the circle are the same, roughly speaking. Right? Seen from the origin, you know, there, there's a nice, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, if you look at the conformal max that, the maps that sort of uh, fix, the, fix uh, the origin, it's just the rotations on the circle and the rotations which are the conformal a Mobius transformation from the disk on the disk that preserves zero. Here, you know, the transformation from the upper half plane onto the upper half plane that are normalized at infinity, like in the way we said before, they are just the translations. So here we define it in this way, and then what is the natural time parameterization for this radial uh, definition? So what is the natural time that you want to use? So there's one thing which is clearly increasing in this picture. Right? And this is the derivative at 0. We know it's a real number. Right? We know it's a real number, and it's clear that you know, uh, here gamma gets closer to 0. So if you want to you know, map this back onto the original thing, you have to stretch thing around 0 so that this, makes, this works. So it's a very simple exercise to check that you know when gamma, you know, moves down on the inside, that the derivative f prime t of 0 would be an increasing function, continuously increasing function. And in particular, it satisfies also something that is reminiscent of what we had in the call, I mean, in the half-plane case, which is that if I compose two conformal map like this, ft, say, in a, in some f tilde s, and if you look at what happens to the derivative at 0, well, the derivative at zero of the composition of two maps that preserve zero is just a product of the derivatives. Okay. Remember, in the upper half plane, we had this thing that when you, comp when you were composing two maps, gt and g tilde s here, that you know the half plane capacity were additive. And so therefore, the half plane capacity was a natural way to parameterize the size of the sets. Here, the natural way to parameterize things is to say, well, I mean, choose the parameterization of gamma such that f prime t of 0 is exponential of t. Because then 
That just means that if you compose one map such that the derivative is exponential t with another one such that the derivative is exponential of s, you get a map such that the derivative is exponential t plus s. And so that corresponds to the idea that you know time t has elapsed and then time s has elapsed and then when you map one plus the other, time t plus s has elapsed. So it's natural to take the exponential here instead of just uh, t or whatever because here things are, you know, it's the product of the f primes that shows up when you compose two conformal maps. So everything here I'm saying is, is extremely elementary, but I want to be slow here. So what Levner then says is the following, is that if you define ft in this way, and now, of course, you have a special point, which is the image of the tip here, which we call, say, zeta of t. And it's somewhere on the unit circle. Now, again, because of the fact that we use the right time parameterization, you know, when you continue, to, when you grow a little piece here, you know, uh, then this corresponds to growing a little piece here. Right? And that the size, you know, of this little piece will be just given by, you know, the difference. I mean, here, if I go up to t plus s, the size of this little piece would correspond to a parameterization up to time s in that domain. Now, exactly as in, in the uh, caudal Levner chain, what, what is happening is that at first order, when you grow something, say, near 1, and something very small, whatever shape it takes, as long as it is continuous here, at first order, the behavior of this conformal map uh, ft seen far away from this point. So ft of, if I take z here and I look at ft of z when z is fixed and t goes to 0, and I, some, when I grow something started from 1, exactly as in the caudal case, what you get is that ft of z looked, uh, first order it looks exactly the same as if something straight would be growing. here. And if something straight is growing here, that means that you have the conformal map ft that maps back, you know, something straight in the disk, back to the disk is something uh, that you can explicitly write, you know, using R tangent or this is type of. Uh, it is, in a way, you can say it's a schwarz christoffel map in some way, if you want. So, uh, so it should not surprise you, you know, that basically what you get is something like D when t is going to 0, that ft of z has an explicit uh, formula. And the explicit formula is minus uh, z times uh, z plus 1 over z minus 1. Remember that it, f0 of z here is z. So that's what you get. That's this, you know, explicit thing that comes out of understanding what happens for the straight slit. And then exactly the same argument then in the caudal case tells you that if I start something which is not exactly uh, straight here, I get the same equation at first order when t goes to 0. So, and because we chose the right time parameterization here, this will be also true near, you know, at any time t, except that then you have to replace z by ft of z. So what you get is the equation which is partial difference. I mean, this is minus ft of z times ft of z plus xi t divided by ft of z minus xi t. So that's the differential equation satisfied by ft uh, in terms of xi. Okay. And you have f0 of t. So the exact, I mean, the explicit value is not so important. It's just that it's exactly the same philosophy as the one we had before in the caudal evolution case. So if you know xi, you can recover ft and you can recover the curve gamma as in the cold case. 
So it's just you know another way to encode this growing thing, except that because in, instead of encoding it, at, as, as use it via the size and sort of the the way you know things are wiggling, seen from uh, seen from uh, infinity, you are encoding it by the size and this and the way things are wiggling, you know, seen from the origin. So there's one little thing that is, makes life also nice in, the, in these radial settings. And it's just a general fact about uh, derivatives here of conformal maps here. So what I want to explain now is I take, suppose that you take any conformal map or any conformal map from a subset of the, of the disk. Uh, back to the disk. So let's take f such that f of zero, is zero, f prime of zero is positive. So we choose this. And you ask, okay, what is the distance, Euclidean distance, between zero and this set k? Is there some relation between, can you know, uh, I mean, between this Euclidean distance d and this derivative of 0? You know, the derivative of 0 tells you, you know, by how much locally near 0 you have to stretch things back, you know, in order for this domain, you know, to uh, get back, back to the original disk. So of course, the larger f prime of zero is, you know, you have the impression the smaller the distance uh, to the origin of k is. Now, there's a very simple observation that you can make. So the first simple observation, so maybe it goes as follows, that if you have a set k here, you have the distance here, maybe that is, that's the distance then that means that k, you know, is outside the disk of radius d. Okay. So, therefore, that the derivative, you know, at the origin of the map that removes k is smaller than the derivative of the origin than the map uh, z gives z over d. The map that maps z to z over d is just the map, you know, that blows up this entire disk. And I just said, you know, that the derivative, the larger a set is, the more, you know, the, the, the larger the derivative at the origin has to be. So it tells you that here you have two sets. The one is k, and the derivative at the origin of the map, you know, that removes k is... Uh, f prime of 0. And I have another one which is larger than k, which is just, you know, this entire annulus. And there are, in order to, to map back to the original disk, this domain, you have to just multiply by 1 over d. So this just says that, you know, 1 over d uh, which is the derivative of the origin of something that removes something larger, okay, is larger than f prime of 0. Right? f prime of 0 cannot be larger than 1 over d. Okay. And so in a way, what you, what you used here was the fact that the, you know, seen from 0, If you have to spend some money to get close to, you know, some money in terms of derivative, you, you, have a, you, are, you, have a, you are allowed to spend some, some derivative of a conformal map, but, and you want to get as close to the origin as possible. Right? So this is just saying that the worst strategy, you know, is to use this domain. Rightfully, you take as symmetric as possible. That way, you know, if you have to use a certain derivative, you you surround it such a way that you, uh, 
it's as symmetric as possible, and you get uh, you don't get close to the. Aura. You could have been much more efficient than that. There's no way to be less efficient than that, you know, than just coming uh, there. Now, what is the? If I tell you, okay, you have to, you are allowed, you know, to use. To you want to start from the origin, and after some time, you know, uh, in terms of the parameterization by. Uh, T here over there with the, after some time T, you want to be as close as the origin uh, of the origin as possible. Well, what is the best uh, strategy? Well, the best strategy is just to go straight, right? So if you do this from here to there, that's the best way to get as close to the origin as you can in a given time, where time means the derivative at the origin. In particular, what you see here is that this uh, derivative of the origin of this map anyway will anyway be worse than the derivative of the origin you know of the map from the entire you know uh, domain where you remove uh, infinite half line starting from here. Uh, to the to unit disk because this domain here is larger than this one. Okay. And just because of scaling uh, arguments, you know, as if you come here closer and closer, uh, anyway the the conformal map here, you know, will be just uh, proportional to the distance uh, to the origin here the derivative at the origin. And therefore, what you end up with is just that immediately you get that 1 over d will be smaller than some constant times f prime of 0. That's where you go through, go to. And it turns out that this constant you can write explicitly because you know explicitly the conformal map from the slit plane into the disk. And it turns out that this constant is 4. Right. So that is what we call Kerber's one quarter theorem. So this is, you know, in page five or six of complex analysis textbooks of undergraduate studies. So it's not a big deal. So this says that whatever you do, if you know f prime of zero, you have some estimate between you have some estimate about the distance, because you know that f prime of zero will be smaller than uh, one over d and larger than uh, 1 over 4d. Or in other words, that d, let's put it this way, d will be smaller uh, than 1 over f prime of 0 and larger than 1 over 4 f prime of 0. So after time t, if, this, if, if we are in the time parameterization that we had before, after time d, the distance dt between gamma, curve gamma, and uh, the origin will be uh, smaller than e to the minus t, because I chose f prime t to be exponential t, and larger than 1 fourth of e to the minus t. Okay. So that's nice, because you know in, in our uh, setting about you know, exploration of annuli and that type of thing, it was important, you know, to know at what time in this uh, SLE time parameterization you reach the inside of the annulus. And so here, reaching the inside of the annulus, you don't know exactly at what time t it corresponds to in terms of the Leuvenet chain, but you know roughly when this happens. You know, you, you know roughly that the time at which you will hit the circle of radius r will be sometimes, you know, between uh, log 1 over r and 4 times log 1 over r, something like that. So, um, or the other way around, uh, with 1 quarter. So, uh, 1 over 4 r, okay, anyway, but... So you, you know, roughly speaking, up to a multiplicative constant at what time this will happen uh, in terms of this parameterization. So that's very useful. 
and there's no real direct equivalent of this type of feature in the caudal half plane case. No, to say that the Euclidean distance of something can be estimated nicely is not so easy. Remember, Euclidean distance are typically things that are not conformally equivalent, uh, invariant, so they are not so easy to study. But here, you have, you know, uh, bounds, uniform bounds on this. Okay, I'm, I'm going very slowly, but. Uh, So now I want to just to explain to you what happens to our, you know, our exploration process or, uh, in the, in the, of percolation when delta goes to zero and you look at it seen from an inner boundary point, inner point, not a boundary point. So suppose I start from one and I take a discrete exploration process gamma delta. So I have zero here, I have one, say, here, a minus one. And maybe I have some other point here. Now, so I explore this guy here. So there are two ways to look at it. One way is to look at it, the same curve can be viewed as seen from minus one and can seen, be seen as, I mean, can be looked at seen from zero. Now, imagine that you look at it seen from zero. That means that you map it back by ft, or imagine that this is already the scaling limit, you know, where delta goes to zero of this curve. Anyway, we know the scaling limit exists because it's a chordal guy. You know, it's, it's, it's a, but, I mean, we know that as long as you don't disconnect the origin, you can view it as something like that goes to minus one, as long as you don't disconnect the origin from minus one. You, it's, the say, it's just the starting of the curve, the, the interface that going from zero, minus one, or from plus one to minus one. So define ft in the way we, we said before. So then here we are. And here zeta t is somewhere here. And maybe, you know, ft of minus 1, you know, will be now, I don't know, uh, somewhere here. It's a bad, bad picture. It's not exactly, yes, distorted, but anyway. Now, how do you continue? How do you continue? Well, you are going to continue using blue and orange from here. This is just because of, you know, the SLE6 definition. You know, I map, I take the image, and I know how do I continue from here to here. This is, you know, I know that here, the S, this is the SLE from here to there. That's the way I want to continue. So it's the SLE from here to there by conforming variance. And so it's the limit of the exploration process, you know, started from here, at least at the beginning. But now you have something uh, that you could use, which is the fact that SLE6 has this locality property. So when you start from here, it doesn't change anything whether you target this guy or the, whether you target the guy which is exactly on, this, on the other side, which is minus psi of t. Okay. So, so how do you continue here? Let's draw it here in, or in, in yellow. Well, the way you continue here is just the scaling limit of the exploration process starting from zeta of t, aiming at minus zeta of t in the disk. Okay. But by definition, because of conformal invariance of, you know, uh, Loewner chains, this is just exactly the same as a rotation by this angle of the thing you started with, which was going from 1 to minus 1. Right? You start exploring here. You map by ft. And how do you continue? You start, you continue doing exactly the same thing, except that you have rotated things by this angle, by, by this vector e, xi, or zeta, 
depending on how you read this. Sometimes my size look like zeta and vice versa, and sometimes I say zeta instead of, of xi. So it's just the same, right? There's just one one quantity here today. Okay, so what is the conclusion of this? The conclusion of this is that if you take a chordal take a chordal I mean take sort of SLE six from plus one to minus one in the unit disk. Right? As long as it does not disconnect so let's put it here. parameterize it seen from zero. Okay, using this conformal map FT and the size seen from zero. What I just say is that as long as you don't disconnect zero as long as gamma does not disconnect zero from minus one, it satisfies put it like this some conformal I mean some exploration property, which is that You are just, you know, doing a little piece, mapping back by FT, and then you have to start the same thing, exactly the same thing again, modulo this rotation. Okay. So what comes out of this for free is that zeta of T, or psi, you know, and if you write it to like exponential I times uh, theta of T, so if now theta of T is this angle here, If then theta of t has independent increments. So this is just saying, well, OK, imagine that now from here to here, I have rotated by this theta of t. Where will I be after time t plus s? So then I will apply the same thing corresponding to some time s, starting from here. So I will have rotated an angle theta tilde of s after that. And so what you get is that theta of t plus s is theta of t plus theta tilde of s corresponding to what happened be time, between time t and t plus s. OK? So it should not surprise you that chordal, I mean, OK, so that the bound, I mean, the the SLE6, as we defined it before, from b going from one boundary point to another boundary point, if you view it, so uh, if you view it, um, you know, if you parameterize it in this uh, radial way, sort of targeting an inside point, that this function zeta or psi that you are using, you know, in order to see uh, how this grows, seen from zero, this would be just a Brownian motion on the unit circle running at a certain speed. Okay, so there exists alpha such that uh, theta t is uh, Brownian motion running at speed alpha t. What is this? Alpha t over alpha is a Brownian motion. Right? So why not to take this scaling limit of a percolation exploration process, and I look at it in the radial way, seen from zero, then uh, what happens is uh, that this driving process psi that replaces w in this setting has to be some Brownian motion on the unit circle running at a certain speed. OK, so what speed did it run at? I mean, we know that the w that was defining the thing in the upper half plane, you know, was shaking at speed 6, if you want, on an infinitesimal level. And it's quite clear, you know, that there will be a one-to-one -one relation between uh, the kappa and the alpha here. And the relation is very simple. It's uh, kappa. It turns out that kappa is alpha. 
right? So here, alpha has to be 6. The reason is, you know, on when you are very, very small here, the way this guy is oscillating here, seen from 0 or seen from minus 1 is the same. That's very roughly speaking. But it's, it's a simple exercise to check that on small scale, you know, uh, they behave the same way, and therefore, you know, the, the, the way uh, the speed of the Brownian motion that you use here is uh, kappa. So that's why, you know, there was this one was defined first by Odet Ram, this uh, version of in the radial one, and then it was natural to, to say that kappa is the speed at which you grow when you measure by the derivative at the origin of the conformal map. And so that's why there was a strange parameterization of half plane capacity with the two. Uh, in the end, because that's what you end up with when. So, in other words, you can say that the reason you get exactly the same value here is just because we have defined the half-plane capacity in such a way that you get that the speed in the half-plane capacity way is going to be the same as in the radio model. Okay, so here I have given you a soft proof, but it's a true proof of the following fact. Right, so maybe I should state it, uh, which is basically the theorem, sort of radial uh, caudal. Caudal would be, you know, from boundary to boundary. Radial would be from boundary to inside. That's why they are called like this, SLE6, which is the following. So if one defines... theta t, which is a Brownian motion running at speed 6 times t, and then zeta t is e to the i theta t, then solves uh, uh, the ODE in the disk. and defines ft and then gamma t or 2 sle6 in the unit disk from 1 to minus 1 so this is a curve gamma so let's call this one gamma hat just to say that it's not the same then gamma and gamma hat have the same law up to the first time at which they disconnect 0 from minus 1. So what I, this is just the following statement, which is that I take the disk here. Right? I have 0 here, I have minus 1, and I define a, a curve that starts from here. Okay, this is an SA, caudal SLE6. As long as caudal SLE6 does not disconnect the origin from minus 1, you know, I can apply the previous uh, reasoning to say that the, the, the way to encode this in a radial way would be via the Brownian motion running at speed 6 times t on the boundary of the unit circle. So that means that it would be via 1 here. And I told you that if I know the driving process on the unit circle, you know, this psi, then I can recover gamma, I mean, I can recover ft also by the ordinary differential equation in the disk. So that means that, you know, as long as these two things, as this doesn't happen, you can, you know, as long as the discrete exploration process didn't have to choose whether to go towards 0 or towards minus 1, then they are the same, and therefore they can be, you know, encoded by, uh, viewed either like, 
our usual way, like going from one to minus one and seeing it at the scaling limit of this interface, or it's going to be go from one to zero uh, with kappa equals six and the Brownian motion running at the boundary of the unit circle. Okay. Now, why is this? Uh, so this tells you the following. It tells you that this is some, some soft theorem that tells you that if I choose zeta t on the unit circle to be Brownian motion running at speed 6 times t, and I solve the differential equation like this, then up to the first time, this will create a curve gamma up to the first time at which the curve gamma uh, doesn't inter disconnect the unit uh, uh, 0 from minus 1, and that this curve gamma had exactly the same law as a, the guy SLE6 that goes from 1 to minus 1 up to that disconnection time. Okay. So what does this what does this uh, radial guy do now once this disconnection occurs? Right? Imagine that I define I try to continue after that time. You know, I know that when I reach here. So it's the same as, as the caudal guy up to the time at which you disconnect. Right. Now here, if I just formally say, okay, theta t is a Brownian motion running at time 6 times t, and I just continue. And formally I solve the old differential equation, I can always continue to solve this. Then what will happen is that the conformal map ft, you know, there will be very different, I mean, there will be a big difference between the guy seen in the unit circle. I mean, it's seen from zero and seen from uh, minus one. So here, just to, so that you see what. If this is going almost disconnecting, right? If you normalize things seen from zero, what do you see? Well, basically, see, basically speaking, what you see is this domain seen from zero. Here, there's a little fjord that is going to cut out, be cut out a bit later. So basically, you see this when you look at this seen from the unit from the inside. But what does this guy see here? This guy sees that, roughly speaking. Right? So just before disconnecting, they still, they still see both the same domains. But because of the fact that they're renormalized in this different way, you know, the two domains are going to converge. The first one is going to converge to the orange one, and the other one is going to converge to the yellow one. and then they will live separately, uh, on sort of split. So what is going to happen to the orange guy is that the orange guy, you know, will, after, if you try to continue to force the picture to continue after time, after the disconnection time, what you have is that at, at the disconnection time you have the conformal map that maps the orange domain map to the or, to the unit disk f at the disconnection time. This connection time is, of course, a stopping time for the filtration generated by the Brown in motion uh, Xi. Because, you know, Xi generates the curve, and so uh, d if you know Xi, you know if you have disconnected or not. And therefore, what is going to happen if you apply the strong Markov property for you know, Brown in motion and this stopping time is that how do you continue? Well, you just continue, you know, you end up somewhere here. This is the image of that point. And you just continue growing to the inside uh, like you did for before, you know, starting from here. So which means that you, now you, you continue growing to the inside in that domain. Okay. So this means that this radial guy, so the guy which is defined like this, you know, start a brown motion running at speed 6 times t on the unit disk, on the unit circle and solve this differential equation with partial differential derivative of respect to t of ft equals minus ft times ft plus zeta over ft minus zeta. This will define a, a curve, an orange curve here like this, that, will, that you can view it in the following way. It is exactly caudal, I mean, it's like SLE6 up to the first time at uh, first disconnection time. And after that disconnection time, it's again SLE6, but now started from here in that new domain, 
uh, and maybe you can fix some other points, and you can continue like this up to the first time you disconnect some point you chose on the boundary here, and then you continue. Okay. Now this is exactly the procedure I described to you for this discrete exploration. Remember? The discrete exploration process and the, on the discrete lattice, targeting to zero, Remember, that was the, the guy that was leaving blue to one side, orange to the other side. You continue exploring until you close the loop here. When you do close the loop here, you decide to go to the inside. So we decide, no, we start again from here, and uh, we explore to the inside here. And I close the loop here, I continue to the inside. This guy, up to the first disconnection time, converges to this radial SLE6 up to the first disconnection time, because it's the first piece of, a, of, a, of this guy, uh, of the chordal guy that we, so it's just a part of the theorem that we proved yesterday. And we know that the, the first disconnection, discrete first disconnection time is converges to the continuous disconnection time. That's the lemma we had the other day. Right? And we know what? We know also that at that moment, the law of now this domain, which is the domain which is seen from zero at the disconnection time, because the discrete curve con converges to the continuous curve, seen from here, the law of this random orange uh, potato seen from zero when delta goes to zero, converges to the corresponding one for SLE. Right? And therefore, you can apply, you know, you can apply the, the convergence result again when, when you start from here. Because when I do, you know, after the first disconnection time here, two things happen. When delta goes to zero, this blue domain, uh, this blue, uh, this curve converges to SLE6 up to the first radial SLE6 up to the first disconnection time, and the law of this blue guy here converges to the law of uh, the the SLE up to the first disconnection time, up to up from of this domain. So you can continue, you can iterate, you can say now, if I would start again from here, the same procedure in that domain, you know. up to the first disconnection time in this domain, uh, when delta goes to zero, this will converge to the law of the first disconnection time in that new domain, which is random, uh, of the SLE6 itself. So there's a slight slope to a point, but here everything you know matches perfectly, and the fact that we have used, you know, karate ordinary convergence in terms of that we are allowed to approximate discrete I mean, our domains by uh, okay, okay. Uh, our domains by discrete um, uh, things in a f fairly uh, soft way uh, tells you that if you just iterate this procedure, you know, after first disconnection times, and then once you are there, you start again in the inside, and you continue like this. What you get is the following theorem, which is just that radial discrete. radial exploration converges in law as delta goes to zero to the radial SLE6, which is the guide defined by procedure one there. So it's not, it's not only true up to the first disconnection time, you can go all the way. So what are we going to do after the break? After the break, we're going to use this because we want to estimate What is the probability, say, that the SLE, or no, that there are, say, two arms like this? Let, let us take sort of a, divide this into two pieces. 
um, what is the probability here that there exists an orange path here and a blue path here? When R is fixed, one is here, and the mesh of the lattice delta goes to zero. So is this something we can estimate when R is very small? And the answer will be yes, because this corresponds exactly to the fact that this radial SLE, starting from here, did not close, did not close any loop. Because each time it would have closed the loop, you know, it would have found out either an orange uh, loop or a blue loop. So it means that up to the first time at which it hits this circle of radius R, the SLE started from here, did not close any loop. And we use, we're going to use the radial description of this guy, not the causal description of this guy to estimate this. One reason is, for instance, that when R is very small, we know approximately when, it, when this will happen that the curve will hit this disk of radius R. This will be roughly, you know, at time log 1 over R. And so the question will be just something like, when does a radial SLE, I mean, what's the probability that the radial SLE run up to time log 1 over R does not uh, disconnect minus 1 from 0? And this is the type of, of, of things, you know, like we had yesterday, uh, type of probability of a simple event. What is the probability that a certain point, you know, on the boundary hasn't been swallowed by the SLE curve before a given time? So this is something that we can, we will be able to, to, to control. So, okay, so let's make, um, I really have to finish by 12 if you want to have lunch, so uh, not more than 10 minutes break.